the shooting range. In this episode, the story of the famous Curtis P-36, the deadly self-propelled anti-aircraft vehicles in War Thunder, Hotline. The developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with Meet the Magach 3. This is a Tier 5 premium tank. It can be easily mistaken for the M48A1. They even have the same BR. 7.7. But there are still some differences. For example, instead of the M41 90mm gun, the engineers squeezed in the M68 105mm one right from the M60. They have also changed the Commander Cupola, so this one became a lot harder to shoot from a kilometre away with the T54 or T62. The engine is 750 horsepower which is enough to get this tank up to 48 kph of maximum speed. And the numbers are true. On wider maps, we've managed to get it up to 46. In real battle, you'll be quite okay on stable 30 to 40 kph, depending on your driving skills and the map. The reverse is less encouraging though. Only 7 to 8 kph. Though, we've seen worse parameters, haven't we? The M68 gun fires four types of ammo. The APDS and Hesh shells won't get you very far, though they will find their audience, no doubt. But the M456 Heat FS shell, piercing 400 millimeters of armor, is an obvious winner here. The gun also has great flatness and fires very precisely, so it's no problem if you want to fight at long distances. The only thing this weapon lacks is a stabilizer. The optics are also quite nice, so you can clearly see any target. The reload rate is very pleasant as well, only 6.7 seconds. Now, remember that your main opponents in this BR are the T-54 and the T-62, and they reload in 8.5 and 12 seconds respectively. Warms the heart, doesn't it? The rotation and elevation angles are the same as with the M48. 24 degrees per second and from minus 9 to 19 degrees, so you're good to use the heights. It gets a lot less exciting when you look at the defense stats. Only four crew members. A very high profile and not the sturdiest armor, especially in the lower glacy plate area. The anti-aircraft guns won't get to you, especially if you protect your most delicate parts. But it would be unwise to stand in the way of the enemy shells. You've only got 110 millimeters of armor in the hull and 128 in the turret. Take extra care of your engine. Any successful penetration will cause your power plant to break. The silver lining is that you've got some smoke shells and they will save your life on many occasions, that's for sure. From the gameplay perspective, the Magach 3 is quite versatile. We don't recommend using it as a striking frontline force but it's quite possible to capture a point with some smoke shells or flank the enemy, as you've got a great weapon and agility. You'll also be effective at some key positions from where you can control the attack of your opponents. And now, the story of an aircraft that saw every corner of the world. Glenn Curtis was an amazing racer, pilot, engineer and businessman. From the beginning of the aviation era, he was constantly developing the company named after him and by the end of the 1920s, he had managed to turn into one of the biggest aviation corporations on the planet. Curtis created and mass-produced planes, engines, air screws, airborne instruments, components for air and ground use, and everything else aircraft related. His planes, that usually were ahead of their time, went around the world in their thousands. But in 1930, he died. And the news about it paralyzed his empire. 
Then came the Great Depression, along with a whole series of low-quality models that no one bought. The management board was desperately trying to replace its dead genius creator. They finally found a new capable chief engineer, though they had spent four long years searching for him. His name was Donovan Rees Berlin, though his success also didn't come right away. The new fighter monoplane with a nine-cylinder radial engine lost the competition to Seversky P-35. Then it got a new engine, the 14-cylinder Twin Wasp, but the plane lost again, this time to the P-43 Lancer. The military only remembered about it when Seversky didn't fulfill his contract, and they needed some extra planes to accompany the big series of the Lancers. The Curtis Company got a very small contract for their plane, now called the P-36. But suddenly, it became quite popular outside the United States. Very popular even, they wanted it in France and Holland, to China and Siam. By the way, the scheme of the chassis from the P-36 became quite famous on its own. Don Berlin made the wheels retract inside the wing while turning 90 degrees to save space. This idea got stuck in a lot of countries. It was, and still is, used in all kinds of airplanes from the American Hellcat and the Japanese Ki-87 and to the Soviet Il-10. And in all these cases it is known as the Curtis chassis, even though the patent originally belonged to Boeing. The P-36 was also great when it came to modifications. In the USA, it was considered an average model. But it found its home in the British Royal Air Force, the French and Dutch Air Forces, and a lot of other places. It worked perfectly with the unusual 7.5mm machine guns in Europe. Also, there was a curious situation in Siam when the French pilots, flying the Hawk 75, which was the name of the P-36 that was sold for export, fought against those same Hawk 75s owned by Siam. During the Second World War, it was used in multiple occasions. The P-36, used in the Pacific, they were mostly Dutch, were obliterated by the Chinese Zero fighters that were a lot better. After France capitulated, the Germans gave some of the French P-36 fighters to Finland, where they served all the way until the early 50s. In Northern Africa, the French P-36 of the Vichyites attacked the American Wildcats and even managed to ground some of them while the American pilots were trying to understand why they were attacked by the planes made in their own country. Did it help the Curtis Corporation to get back in the game? It sure did. Those planes were sold for a lot of money. And who they were fighting for? Uh, it's just business. The faster they would be grounded, the faster the potential buyers would come back for more. Donovan Berlin was already preparing a new success, installing the inline liquid-cooled Allison engine into the same P-36. But this is a story for another time. Everybody loves killing tankers, right? Everyone loves killing tankers, right? Well, did anyone ask the tankers themselves? We don't think so. We can't let it slide, guys. The next section of the show is all about getting some revenge on those nasty pilots. Okay, the simplest way to get some pilots killed is to become one. But today, we take another approach. We don't fly, and we won't let others do the same, on any rating. Now, how would you do that? With the right anti-aircraft vehicle, of course. Let's see what machines are most suitable for this kind of gameplay on all tiers. There are two SPAAGs that will make your pilot enemies fear you from the first hours of the game. One of them is the first French SPAA, the P7TAA, with four 13.2 Hotchkiss machine guns. This firepower 
will destroy anyone who thinks of getting close to your tanks. It will also be good against the enemy ground vehicles. Though there is one more advantage against the planes. It's very compact which makes it easier to hide while waiting for the enemy pilots to come closer. The second SPAAG doesn't have that many weapons and no machine guns at all. What does it have then? That's right, a 20mm cannon. We're talking about the German Gepard, of course. If you see it, turn your plane around and hope that your ground-based teammates will do the same thing. We wouldn't hope, though. 20mm plus 1,080 shots. Any tank at this BR won't get away. Second tier makes it harder. Some like the American M16. Others prefer the Flak 36. And we personally like the 94KM ZIS-12. Its two 25mm cannons will tear apart anyone who gets in their range. This vehicle also has great speed, so you'll get deadly and fast at the same time. Going to Tier 3, and here everything is obvious. Pick both of the German SPAAG's bases on the Panzer IV and you won't fail. Why? It's all about the combined stats. Every German tanker will decide for himself which of the two would better suit his gaming style. The Webelwind, with its four 20mm cannons, will need only a couple of shots to announce that nobody would fly around him without heavy consequences. The only flaw of this machine is its slow reload rate. As for the Ostwind, this one is the quintessence of calmness. It has only one weapon, but it's sharp, long-ranged, and is great against the other ground targets as well. Coming to Tier 4, take a closer look at the French AMX-13 DCA-40. This baby has only one gun. But the great part is it almost never overheats. Then add great ability, low profile, an amazing penetration rate, and you'll understand why we would pick this one. The second best option here is the only German SPAAG of Tier 4, the Flakpanzer V Corleone, with its two 37mm Flak 44 cannons. Tier 5 gives us another French vehicle, the AMX 30 DCA. This time, it has two guns with the lesser caliber, only 30mm. What's its secret then? Check this out. A radar, an ESS, smoke grenades, and an overwhelming fire rate. No aircraft will ever have a chance here. Finally, Tier 6. Here we've got no winners, as all the SPAAGs of this era are great, and in capable hands, they are equally deadly against enemy pilots. They probably need a special overview apart from the others. Let us know in the comments if you'd like to see a video about the top-tier self-propelled anti-aircraft weapons. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline, the developers answering questions from the comments. The first question was asked by a user called Red. BT-42, when, please? Hi there, we'd like that Anim too, but that's a huge maybe. For now, it's not our first priority, that's for sure. A player called Milton Daniel Lopez Lopez writes, How does the marketplace affect users that won't use it? Well, it shouldn't affect them at all. After all, you can completely turn the additional skins off. Except for the historical ones, can't you? Zachary Ponto asks, can I have a plea the fear flying a pancake? Hi, mate. Well, you can open our previous April Fool's episode. That would be number uh, 38. It's right here. We're sure you can find this model somewhere among the user mode content at live.warthunder.com. As for the, so to say, official game version, no plans for it now. And the last, very serious message was sent by a player called Xermandexk. Stop to choose the stupid questions, please. Oh, the irony of that question asked under the video, where we answer the comments for the April Fool's episode. 
That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.